Thank you for tuning in. I'm introducing this conversation I got to have with the award-winning author Robert Whittaker. I'm a psychologist involved in addressing the mental health crisis of our time, and I'm concerned with the rate at which people are being prescribed psychiatric drugs. I think these drugs have their place, but I don't think their place is the first attempt to solve people's mental health struggles but that's often how they're being used. And in many cases, people are not made fully aware of the adverse effects, and they're not made fully aware of the addictive nature of the drugs and how difficult it can be to come off of them. So I reached out to Robert Whitaker because he's a leading expert in the literature around psychiatric drug treatment. He wrote three books related to psychiatry and drug treatment. One is called Mad in America, which came out in 2001. He wrote An Anatomy of an Epidemic in 2010, and this one is a thorough analysis of the evidence for and against drug treatment, and it won Best Investigative Journalism Book of the Year. And his most recent book is Psychiatry Under the Influence. We have a great conversation. We talk about the origins of psychiatric drug treatment and the reasoning behind it. We talk about the phenomenon of malingering which is when people pretend that they have a mental disorder. And we talk about other possible causes and solutions to mental health difficulties. So thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the Psychology Is channel and enjoy the conversation. Thank you for joining us, everyone. I'm here with the award-winning journalist, Robert Whitaker. It is such a pleasure to be talking with you. I've been following your work for a long time. And I'd like to start our conversation by saying that it was your book, The Anatomy of an Epidemic, that really opened my eyes to the extreme discrepancy between evidence and practice in the field of psychiatry. And my understanding of that has only been deepening both because I ended up writing a dissertation uh, on specific treatments for schizophrenia, which brought me deep into that literature. And then also because of the work that I do as a psychologist, I work in a jail and I work alongside psychiatrists. And we don't exactly collaborate, although I think we, we could afford to more, but I become well aware of you know their role with the inmates in the jail. So I can share some stories about that, which I'll do later in this conversation, but I just wanna start by letting you speak to this discrepancy that I just talked about. So what do you see as the discrepancy between the scientific evidence and the current practices in the field of psychiatry? Sure. Oh, first of all, thanks for having me, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, This discrepancy is, is in a way the big problem because there is such a huge discrepancy between what you actually find in the scientific literature and sort of the public story, the narrative told within the profession of psychiatry and then to the public, that narrative, what is told in those spheres is so different from what you actually find in the scientific literature. And it really is all encompassing. So let's just start with diagnosis. So, you know, there's been these educational campaigns to convince us that psychiatric disorders are diseases of the brain, right? And this goes back to the 80s and we heard the old depression is a disease of the brain. and All these are diseases of the brain. <clears throat> so that was the first thing, a diagnostic conception that we would organize our thinking around the thought these are physical illnesses in essence, brain illnesses. And as a part of that, we were then told that um, psychiatry discovered or psychiatric researchers had discovered that a chemical imbalances were the cause, these, these were the, that was the pathology that was found in psychiatric disorders. And we now had drugs that fixed that pathology or were antidotes to that pathology, like insulin for diabetes. Now that is a story of tremendous medical progress. You've identified the very molecule that accounts for madness or depression or anxiety or makes kids too fidgety in the school, and you can correct it. And given the complexity of the brain, if that's true, I would say that's the greatest discovery in, in certainly medical history. And we did organize our thinking and our care around that simple story. 
Now, as part of this, we also heard that the drugs were very safe and effective. In other words, the image of the drugs was that you will get a benefit. It's almost a certain benefit across the spectrum of people taking these drugs. And there's going to be some adverse effects. But the sense was that was communicated to the public, say this with antidepressants, is you will get a benefit you otherwise wouldn't have. And then <clears throat> the other thing missing from this whole story was, well, what is happening to people long term? <laughs> you know, are we really helping people, uh, you know, become asymptomatic and function well in society over the long term? Not just be asymptomatic, but how are they functioning? So that's the public narrative we organized ourselves around, which is a story of progress, great advances, and it really fits into a larger story of medical progress, you know, where we find that you know, antibacterial drugs, antibiotics, which are antidotes to bacterial infections. And we do have antivirals and that sort of thing. And this, the chemical imbalance story, fit into that larger narrative of medical progress. But what do you actually find? Well, first of all, you find that um, the, the conception of mental disorders, psychiatric disorders as diseases of the brain goes back to 1980. And that's when the American Psychiatric Association published the third edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. But what you find is, and before that, in DSM-1 and DSM-2, uh, there was a lot of understanding of the, that, that a lot of distress arose from psychological problems, environmental problems, family difficulties, that sort of things. But they reconceived it in 1980. We're going to call these diseases of the brain. And you'll see there was a book called um, The Broken Brain by Nancy Andreessen in I think it was 1984 that really stuck this uh, flag in the ground, so to speak. But what you find is there were no discoveries about the pathology of people with the depression or the pathology of people who were diagnosed with schizophrenia. These were hypotheses, okay, in 1980. We're going to hypothesize that these are diseases of the brain. Now, flash forward, uh, you know, 25, 20 some years when they're doing DSM-5, okay? So they're going to do this uh, we're going to reorganize the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. They hold a, a round table. Now, these are people with diagnostic experts within the American Psychiatric Association. If you go to that round table, they say none of these have been validated as discrete illnesses. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we're being told, oh, we now know that depression is an illness, like a discrete illness, and, maybe, and there's some pathology. And for a long time, we were told it's low serotonin. And then away from it, you have the experts saying, we didn't validate any of these disorders by normal medical standards as discrete illnesses. That's the first thing. We have one thing we're told, these are very discrete illnesses, validated, and then if you dig into the science, they say they did not find that, and there's different ways you validate, validate a disorder. Then the biggest thing is the chemical imbalance story. So what you find in the science is that the chemical imbalance theory of mental disorders did not arise from an understanding of what was going on in people's brains related to neurotransmitters, but actually arose from an understanding of how drugs acted on the brain. Mm -hmm. So for example, researchers discovered that antipsychotics block dopamine transmission in the brain. They thwarted normal dopamine transmission. So researchers hypothesized schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders were due to too much dopamine. In other words, the whole hypothesis arose from how drugs perturbed normal uh, function of neurotransmitters in the brain chemical it's a really key point i just want to really emphasize that and make sure people grasp what you just said that they derived their hypothesis or their idea of what was causing these conditions based on looking at what knocked out the symptoms and so they kind of reverse explained it in a way right exactly saying, that's what they did do they said okay we under we believe these drugs are effective we know, we know this is how they perturb normal, fu normal functioning since the antipsychotics block dopamine receptors. So they block the normal transmission of messages along dopaminergic pathways. So they said, oh, as you said, the reverse, the opposite. Maybe schizophrenia is due to too much dopamine. And the, 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 the chemical imbalance story we know the best is, of course, the story of low serotonin is the problem with depression. People with depression have too little serotonin. Well, that, was, that arose because they understood that antidepressants and say the SSL, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, what they did is they kept serotonin in that synaptic 
cleft between uh, neurons longer than normal. So therefore, you're upping serotonergic activity. So they theorized, well, maybe depression is due to too little serotonin. So first of all, you see that the theory arose not from discovery, discoveries of what was really going on with depressed people, people diagnosed with schizophrenia. Okay, so you have this hypothesis, right? Now you have to see, do people with schizophrenia, diagnosed with schizophrenia, have too much dopamine before they go on the drugs? Or people with depression, do they have too little serotonergic activity before they go on the drugs? Now here's the most amazing thing. If Let's just follow the low serotonin theory of depression in the scientific literature. As early as 1984, the National Institute of Mental Health did a big study to investigate the low serotonergic theory of depression. They said, we're just not finding any uh, lesion or any abnormality in the serotonergic system. That's three years before Prozac came to market. Mm -hmm. Now, Prozac comes to market in 1987, hailed as this break new, breakthrough new medication, said to fix serotonergic imbalances in the brain. Well, the research into the low serotonin theory of depression continues. Now, what does the American Psychiatric Association's own textbook declare in 1998? Didn't pan out. We have found no evidence, this is his own textbook, that low serotonin is in fact a, a, the abnormal, a, a abnormality regularly present in depressed patients, okay? So at the same time they're doing this, the head of the APA and the APA and American Psychiatric Association is actually conducting campaigns to say, Depression is due to too little serotonin, and we fix those. We fix that problem with our drugs. But their own textbook said otherwise. The the the, the investigation into the uh, dopamine hyperactivity um, theory of schizophrenia is a bit more complex, but it too did not pan out that there was a characteristic lesion in the dopaminergic system as as a primary cause of schizophrenia. And in two thousand five, Kenneth Kindler, who was one of the leading investigators in the whole world, and the editor of psychological medicine, I think that's what his, um, the journal he edited, he said, listen, we have hunted for big, simple uh, uh, neurochemical explanations for psychiatric disorders, and we have not found them. Mm -hmm. So think about this again. You're being told you have a chemical imbalance. Millions of people went to their doctor and were told they have a chemical imbalance. This will fix it like insulin for diabetes. It's not a, it's just not, it's not slightly askew. It's, it's totally wrong. Mm. And what is really the betrayal is they knew it at mm. the highest level. Now, there were many psychiatrists who didn't know the research literature, many prescribers, they bought into it too. But at the highest levels, they knew it. Now, there's, there's another element that's even more, I think, uh, disturbing. So you, you're depressed in some fashion. You go on an, uh, an antidepressant, say Prozac or one of the SSRIs. Now that um, ups your serotonergic activity, right? Now when you go on, you have no lesion, you have no known or abnormality in your serotonergic system. But now you go on the drug, it keeps serotonin longer in the synaptic cleft, that's like an, acting as an accelerator on serotonergic activity, while well, your brain being this extraordinarily uh, uh, Plas it has such neuroplasticity and has so many feedback mechanisms. It immediately says, oh, I've got too much serotonergic activity. So now it puts the breakdown on serotonergic activity, and it does so in two ways. The presynaptic neurons, that's the neuron that releases the serotonin into that tiny gap, stops putting out so much serotonin. Now that compensatory adaptation, that attempt to maintain a normal functioning. Researchers say the brain is trying to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium. That, that seems to burn out after a while, that compensatory adaptation. The second part is the receiving neurons, the postsynaptic neurons, um, in response to this drug presence, they actually decrease the density of their serotonergic receptors for serotonin, okay? And now you can understand the drug acts as an accelerant, the brain puts down the brake on serotonergic activity. But think of the irony on this. Yes. When you went in, before you went on the drug, you had no abnormal uh, abnormality with your serotonergic system. The drug actually uh, induces or causes the very abnormality hypothesized to cause depression in the first place. 
And by the way, that's a, a model, a paradigm for understanding how psychiatric drugs work. And then I think it was in 1996, the head of NIMH at that time, Stephen Hyman, who's a neuroscientist, he wrote, he wrote a, a paper called A Paradigm for Understanding Psychotropic Drugs. And he says, all these drugs perturb normal functioning. Mm -hmm. In response to that perturbation, the brain goes through these compensatory adaptations. It's trying to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium. And at the end of this compensatory process, the brain is functioning, these are his words, in a manner that is both qualitatively and quantitatively different than normal. So think about this difference. The public and prescribers are being informed that these are normalizing agents. They're, they're creating a normal functioning neurotransmitter functioning and correcting a, a pathology when exactly the opposite is true. Mm -hmm. There's no known or, or abnormality. And then when you're done, you have the very abnormality physiologically that you had, that was hypothesized to cause the, the problem in the first place. That is the great irony of it all. Yeah, I mean, that is just, you know, I was gobsmacked when I first, because, you know, as a journalist, I had written that these drugs fix, you know, chemical imbalances. Why wouldn't I? call up the experts and say, oh, they fix chemical imbalances like insulin for diabetes. So of course I wrote that. When I first found out that it was just a hypothesis, I was pretty gobsmacked. But when then I really traced in the research literature that they found that the drugs cause these compensatory changes that were the very abnormality hypothesized to cause these problems, I was like, I was stunned mm -hmm. just at this unbelievable gulf, unbelievable you know, distance between what we were being told publicly and what the science was telling. Right. And then, you know, we can go on later, but as we go on to this difference, you know, you find in fact that the drugs really in clinical trials are just barely beaten placebo. Mm -hmm. And in terms of maybe half will have a significant response. It's not like everyone's having a response. And of course, as far as long-term outcomes, the long, when you start searching the long-term outcomes, what you find over and over again is it certainly appears all the evidence is saying that the, that the long-term use of the drugs increases the likelihood you'll still be symptomatic many years later and that you'll be functionally impaired. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean that happens to everybody, okay? But it means compared to what is sort of the natural recovery course for these disorders, right. which you have to know because in order for a drug to do no harm, it has to beat the natural recovery and what you find with the psych, uh, psychiatric, long-term use of psychiatric drugs, not only do they not beat that natural course, you see that, they do, that, that the natural course beats the medicated course. Mm. Which is such an important point. So thank you for explaining that. That's just, I've heard you say before in, an, in a recent interview you gave that this is one of the most pressing social issues of our time and i couldn't agree more we have just to give people more context at this point there are over 80 million people who have been prescribed psychiatric drugs on a yearly basis and that number has been increasing very steadily and the dsm i mean some of our listeners might be aware of this but for context 1952 was the first dsm Second one came out in 1968, and then 1980, and then 1994, and then the DSM-5 emerged in 2013. And in every single edition of the DSM, there have been an addition to, like a, an additional number of disorders and a broadening out of the criteria for depression, anxiety, ADHD. So in general, there's been this dramatic widening of the net for people who can be diagnosed with a mental disorder and it's it's a very i'm aware um i don't know a pessimistic way of looking at it but if you're a drug company you're just salivating over that oh, oh listen yeah of course i mean first of all I, I sort of like the joke but it's not really a joke if you read the dsm and you're not in it if you don't find yourself in it, I'm not sure you're breathing. <laughs> and it's just a little bit of a joke, but really, the, it's just the 
<laughs> all these disorders. I don't even know how many there are now. Right. right. Over but 300. Over 300. And there's always this. And if you don't meet a diagnosis, we can still give you a diagnosis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they'll be like, not otherwise specified. Doesn't right. need, you know. So really, basically, the DSM is meant to be a book that allows for a diagnosis for anybody who comes in with some sort of mm. emotional difficulty. Or if you're seeing kids, behavioral things that the parents don't like or the school doesn't like. So it, and, and we do have to understand this. All of this has occurred within a commercial context. Mm. So one of the things that happened in 1980 when the, when the American Psychiatric Association said, we're going to conceive of these things as um, brain disorders. No, and just let's look at depression historically. Going way back, way back to the Greeks and all, there was always sort of two thoughts about depression. There might be a small group of people this prevalence of this is really quite rare who do have some sort of biological form of depression Mm -hmm. could be and there's illnesses that can cause depression maybe you know there's all sorts of hormonal problems etc anyway that there is a core group that might have a biological form but so the vast majority of people who become depressed uh, so often they they're having setbacks in living (laughs) okay they're in poverty they get divorced they lose a job and uh, you know there's so many things that can make life difficult and we know do know that there are other things you know like trauma uh, and those sort of difficulties that that can have a, a lasting impact on us so for that understanding was depression was mostly seen as a psychological issue a sociological issue and, and not really to be remedied by drugs Mm-hmm. But when they began to say all this mood, anxiety, you know, all these uncomfortable feelings, we're going to say are diseases of the brain. Do you know what the drug companies did? Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. Because you can't get a drug approved for unhappiness. Mm-hmm. You can't get a drug approved for I'm anxious because I don't have a job. <laughs> but you can get a drug approval for anxiety as a medical condition or depression as a medical condition. So the DSM-3, that reconceptualization, just drug companies knew it was going to open up the, an extraordinary expansion of the psychiatric enterprise. And so what do you see happening after that? You see that pharmaceutical companies began throwing money at the APA, American Psychiatric Association, and also hiring academic psychiatrists to start being their advisors, consultants, speakers, because they know that in our society and in societies around the world, medical doctors, especially at academic centers, have a lot of prestige. Mm. So if they become saying, oh, this is a brain illness or these drugs are great and this is a real diagnosis, the public's going to believe it where they might not believe it just for a drug company. And that's what you saw. You saw this extraordinary amount of money going to psychiatrists in the 80s. And there, you know, by the end of the 1990s, there was hardly an, um, an academic psychiatrist who wasn't taking money from the drug companies. Mm. So when you talk about 80 million Americans taking psychiatric drugs, um, from a business perspective, that's a story of success. Mm. Because from the pharmaceutical perspective, they want to build a market for their right. drugs. And that shows they've done it very successfully. Now, I have to say... The American Psychiatric Association as a guild actually has a lot of incentive to want a bigger market too, Mm. right? It it, it increases their influence in society, increases their domain of authority, elevates their prestige, and also makes a demand for their services because, yes, GPs can prescribe drugs, but in most states, psychologists can't. Mm. So... um, You know, that's what we had. We had this extraordinary expansion of the psychiatric enterprise such that we began diagnosing everyone from kids, young kids, to elderly people. And then we get this 80 million people on psychiatric Mm -hmm. drugs, which is, on the one hand, a story of great commercial success. But it is a tragedy in terms of the burden of mental illness, in terms of how we think about ourselves, in terms of how we think about our kids. And boy, the, where you see the tragedy most distinctly is, is what has happened to kids who've grown up in this new era. Mm. Because when you go into freshmen at, co- at college classes, the freshmen in, in, in college, like 20 to 25 to 30% have a diagnosis now because they've been primed to think of themselves as flawed, as having a disorder. Mm. 
Right, right. And I, I, that's where this irks me most deeply is, is when it comes to prescri- prescribing to kids. And, you know, we, we started by talking about the discrepancy between evidence and practice. And correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that in order to get a psychiatric drug approved by the FDA, you don't have to show studies with children. And, and then in practice, these drugs are prescribed to children, even toddlers. Yeah, so the way it works, of course, is you, you can get a drug approved for the market in general by just testing it in adults. But if you want to get pediatric labeling, saying it's, it, specifically it's okay to give to kids, you do have to do a, a test of some sort mm-hmm. for a short period of time to get pediatric labeling. But, you know, the, the antidepressants are an example of how that really doesn't once you get a drug approved on the market and, and this sort of story goes out within continuing education with thought leaders and public, public campaigns, it really doesn't matter if the FDA labels it. And with, so for example, with antidepressants, nearly all the pediatric trials of antidepressants of SSRIs failed. They failed to show efficacy, but it still took off. Mm. And, and, you know, Prozac got, was the first to get labeled, and you can look at those trials, and it was only the prescribers who saw a benefit. Mm. They, when the kids self-evaluated, there was no benefit there. Mm. And, and, and yet, the, the use of these antidepressants in kids and teenagers became, became common, even though the data was quite clear, they, they pretty much doubled the risk of a suicidal event. Mm. So really no benefit. And yet double the risk of a suicide event and all the other adverse effects that come with these drugs. Right. And yet still became quite popular. Mm. And that shows that we, that we like to hear that, uh, you know, psychiatry likes to say it's an evidence-based practice. But when you actually look at the evidence, it's, it's more of a, just a belief practice. We believe this is going to work. Right. And you mentioned something about how there's this, motivation to increase the level of prestige in psychiatry and and many people may know this but it's worth mentioning that psychiatry is an interesting medical field because it's fundamentally different in my opinion from the other medical branches and so of course it's different from psychology and psychiatrists are medical doctors so they go to medical school and then they do their residency where they specialize in psychiatry but the the big difference is that it seems that every other medical branch diagnoses based on very objective testing, whereas psychiatry makes psychiatrists in practice make diagnoses that are quite subjective. And I think they would claim that the DSM makes it more objective, which is debatable. But even in that case, we're not doing physical tests. There's no blood tests or brain scans or anything by, before diagnosing someone which opens up a whole host of issues. But just to emphasize this too, that psychiatry is, has arguably been defined by crises of legitimacy. I mean, if you dial the clock back far enough, pre-1950s, we had lobotomies and organ removal and high pressure shower treatment and drowning therapy and just right. horrifying, torturous treatments. And then and the lobotomies went through the 1960s. So for very good reason, psychiatry had been questioned as whether it was even legitimate. And then, you know, I think the psychiatrist Thomas Saz had an enormous impact on um, encouraging people to question the legitimacy of psychiatry with his book, The Myth of Mental Illness and all of his advocacy. So there's been this deficit of legitimacy and so you can see why the field of psychiatry has been extra motivated to show how scientific they are. And so everything you've shared really fits into that because this makes it seem more scientific. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a couple uh, problems here. Uh, I mean, the diagnoses, and they'll admit this, they're constructs, they're social constructs. Right. You're gonna say, you said makes them more ob- objective. Well. They're just going to define a group of people with, who have some of these symptoms, mm. 
And that definition is not tied to anything biological. It's just right. like, okay, if you're not sleeping, et cetera. So they're going to construct these different categories and say that's this diagnosis and that's diagnosis. But as you say, it's, these are not uh, validated by biological markers. Mm -hmm. So they're constructs to group people together. Right. So right away, you have this problem, right? You have people with medical degrees seeing themselves as physicians, but their diagnostic manual, and diagnostic manuals are key to be practicing good medicine mm -hmm. because you, this, is, this is what enables you to sort of identify what is the particular problem for that person. So they're, they're burdened by sort of um, a delusion right away that their diagnostic manual is, is actually cleaving things into these diseases when they're not, their social mm -hmm. constructs. But the other thing that you're talking about is like a 200 year history of psychiatry wanting to be seen as a legitimate medical discipline in the same way infectious medicine is or cardiology etc and the problem is is <laughs> for sure a lot of what they're dealing with is people struggling with their environment in, in in a psychological way and and then just to go over this why there's this constant question of legitimacy is if that's true, who should have domain or who should have authority professionally over these people who are struggling with their moods or behaviors? And so that's why you've had this historic uh, questioning and, and, and confronting of psychiatry, whether they are legitimately have the authority over this domain of our lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, if you go back to the early asylums, the very first asylums in, in the United States, or in the early 1800s, once we got these called moral therapy asylums, there was a big debate. Who should have authority over them? Should you keep the medical doctors out <laughs> because they'll screw things up? But the problem was the medical doctors at that time said, oh, we don't want to lose authority over these people. <laughs> you know, this is a, remember medicine is a business or a significant uh, part of our population. So they fought to be, uh, sort of gain control of the early asylums. And they pretty much had done that by the 1850s. And uh, the American Psychiatric Association gets its start by the doctors who are running mental hus uh, hospitals get together and they form an association. So it arises from people who are tending to, to people in mental hospitals um, rather than sort of any biological or origin is what I'm trying to say. Right, right. And one interesting phenomenon that is a symptom of this is the phenomenon of malingering, where, as I'm sure you know, people can quite easily feign a mental disorder. And it's, and I, so I mean, I'm willing to share a story here. I mentioned that I, I work in a jail and the truth is that many people who are in this jail where I work are in there on drug charges. So they would self-identify as drug addicts. And they come in and often they're still, they're going through withdrawal symptoms or they're craving. And it kind of dawns on them that, you know what? There actually are access, there is access to drugs, uppers and downers. Um, I just have to go meet with a psychiatrist. Yeah. And so... A specific story recently is this woman tells me she goes, yeah, I was I was craving my my drug, which was heroin, and so she was looking for a downer, and so she went in there and pretended to be hallucinating. So she tells me that she she meets with a psychiatrist and she's acting as if she hallucinates a piranha on her shoulder. So she's putting on this show and she's like pretending to like respond to it, and she's totally fine. Like I I'm talk to her every day. She's very normal, actually. But within 15 minutes, she comes away with a schizophrenia diagnosis and an antipsychotic. Probably Seroquel, right? Yeah, it was Seroquel. Yes. Yeah, because they like Seroquel. Right. <laughs> not as harsh as the other ones. <laughs> right. And, and, and it's just, so, and then when you consider the fact that you can, you can get, you know, social benefits, you know, you can get all kinds of like SSI and everything for a mental disorder if you're diagnosed with it. So there's actually incentive to malinger. And um, 
another story I'll just mention since I'm on the, um, uh, in, in the storytelling mode. Um, I'm, I was meeting with a woman and I felt like we were making great progress in her just development and clarity as a person. And I'd been working with her for months and she was really setting goals and everything was looking really good as she was about to get out of jail, but then things changed. And at first I didn't know why. And it felt like I lost touch with her personality where she was much more aloof. She lost her motivation, her, her enthusiasm. She wasn't as quick to a smile or a laugh. Over the course of about six weeks, she gained, six weeks, she gained about 25 pounds. Um. And I was finally asked her like, what is going on? What has changed? And she told me that she'd been diagnosed and prescribed with a drug called Rimeron. And at that point, I didn't know much about Rimeron. So th- I remember the following week, I was being escorted into the jail and the psychiatrist was walking alongside me. And so I asked him, I, I said, you know, what, what is the mechanism of action exactly for Rimeron? And he explained it in technical terms that it's essentially a dopamine blocker. And But then he he said something as we were parting ways that stuck with me. He said, but no one really knows the downstream effect of all of this. And he said it in a way that was kind of nonchalant and literally shrugged his shoulders like, oh, well. And to me, it was just this moment where I, I realized that he kind of knew that this is just somewhat of an experiment and that there would be many unforeseeable adverse effects because the downstream effect is the 1,000 next links in the chain of chemical reactions that happen after these dopamine transmissions have been blocked. And so, yeah, I mean... so you've raised you've raised a couple of really interesting points. That's absolutely true. And when, when earlier in this podcast, when I spoke about oh, this drug uh, blocks dopamine, and the brain tries to accelerate. That's just the immediate reaction because there's all these feedback loops. It's not like the dopaminergic system exists apart from the serotonergic system. They have all sorts of feedback mechanisms. So, yeah, no one knows, no one has uh, even begun to sort of flesh out all these downstream reactions. So, w- go back to your thing, not just the people in jail. Now, that's a big uh, experiment on 80 million people yes. on society as a whole, right. especially long term. What are we going to do in the cognitive function and blah, blah, blah. Right. And, and, you know, whenever you look at actual drugs, you see so many signs of functional impairment, starting with sexual dysfunction so often. And if you think about how key sexual function is to our, basically what we're supposed to do in life mm-hmm. in terms of an evolutionary principle, you know that's a pretty profound thing to disrupt. You know, one thing about, first of all, there are all sorts of social incentives uh, that get people to want a diagnosis. You know, in the 1990s under Clinton, you know, we ended welfare in essence. So in other words, you, it was became... It, I, th- I think you could no longer get ordinary welfare if you were a family with poor kids, right? So, so many families actually did then have to turn to the SSI system, the disability system, to, to get some support for their, their kids. And so they would get their kids, you know, diagnosed with ADHD or whatever. But then you also have, go to any high school. If you can get a uh, prescription for ADHD, those drugs have a market value. The stimulants, right? They have a street value. Yeah. And I know, I know many kids in high school, they knew how to get a diagnosis. They'd go into the psychiatrist and say like, ah, oh, you know, I can't keep focused. And they'd, right. they'd go in and they deliberately tap their fingers and crap. So they knew how to get a diagnosis. And, you know, there, there was that game being played. The final thing you said that I think is so interesting to me is, and, 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 and sort of relevant to the whole culture of change. So I worked in Attica prison as uh, in 1976 to 78. Mm. So I was there after, I don't know if you remember, there was a big prison riot in, in Attica in the early 70s. People died. So, but the, what was interesting at that time is, and I, I was engaged in, a, in, a, in a, helping people learn to read and get their uh, high school equivalency degrees. At that time, the thought was, you know, many of these people are in there because of drug, the whole drug thing, 
not just using, but because of who was going to control the drug trade and sort of the, 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 that sort of competition. But you know what? Very few people were taking psychiatric drugs. It wasn't, it wasn't, it, it was a really tiny group. And I think the thought was at this time, oh, the people in prison here, they have, uh, you know, been raised in certain environments <laughs> that funnels them much more likely into a criminal justice system, including like the selling of drugs and all. And so we need to rehab, you know, rehabilitate people. And there wasn't a thought that they were mentally ill and needed psychiatric drugs. And I think there even was a thought that psychiatric drugs, which you experienced with one of your patients in, in jail, would be a, um, a hindrance to getting back in society. But this Diagnosing and, and widespread use of drugs in, 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 in you know, jails and prisons, it's, it's post DSM-3 again. Mm. And then we went to this whole thing where we began diagnosing people and then this whole game gets going about people accessing drugs in, psychiat in, in, in you know, prisons and jails. And then the other thing is, from what my understanding is, when I was working in Attica, men, now it was a male prison, they were out of their cells a lot of time. They weren't being locked up 23 hours a day. But then we went through this period where the poor people, these people were getting isolated. And of course, that did cause more disturbances. And so actually, we found a way to pathologize our, our um, prison population, which is, in my opinion, just adds one more burden on them. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, that's exactly like we've, we've been touching on this the whole time. The you know, what, what are the real causes of these difficulties that people experience? Um, even, even extreme, because I, I like the, the saying that I've heard, I don't even know who said it first, but there are, the saying is that there are real mental disorders, but they are rare and unmistakable. So for the person who is experiencing dramatic hallucinations, there's something to that and there may very well be biological roots to that but we have to like objectively figure out what those markers are and not just guess and try to treat based on what our guess is first of all and then also to remember that as we also like to say people are biopsychosocial organisms there's the biological psychological and environmental mental buckets where we can find both potential contributors and potential solutions to all of these issues. And even if you just look in the biological bucket, there are, as you alluded to earlier, many other potential contributors, including, like you said, hormonal imbalances, malnourishment, I think is often quite overlooked as a cause of many things. I mean, ADHD in children, easy example. No Kids, question. Yeah, so, and then, and then, yeah, then there's the psychological and then there's the environmental, so it's-, it's Toxins amazing. in the environment. I Toxins mean, in some, the environment, great example as well. Yeah. You know what, uh, David Healy, in, 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 he's an Irish psychiatrist that is now working in, in Canada. He did this unbelievably interesting paper. So schizophrenia, what got diagnosed with schizophrenia, say a hundred years ago, um, they presented in a very different way than psychotic people. Mm -hmm. You know, they often had trouble making wheeled movements. Some were catatonic, that sort of thing. Well, he's looked at the decline in presentation of that type of presentation mm -hmm. and correlating it with the decline of use of lead and gasoline. Interesting. And it goes, it, they just go along and step in step in, in country after country after the country adopts a, a no lead in gasoline policy. You see a drop in that sort of old time uh, presentation. At least in the United States now, if, from my understanding, if you go into ERs where you see like a, a sort of initial um, psychotic, first episode psychotic patients, a high percentage of them have been doing drugs. Mm. Either, either illicit drugs or, in fact, you know, they've been taking antidepressants and, mm. and sometimes that can stir things, et cetera. Mm. So all I'm going to say is here, my feeling, I think, I think we're absolutely together. There's a lot of different pathways to emotional and behavioral disturbances. Yes. There's certainly a biological ones. There's certainly toxins that can do it. 
and we are mind body machines right so if you disturb the body there's no question you can disturb the mind mm -hmm. but you know at the same time if you're at war with your own environment or if you're afraid of your own environment that's going to come out physically too mm. so you know one of the you know we are having more attention on trauma and sexual abuse and that sort of thing but one of the things if you want to look at women diagnosed with a psychotic disorder or, or look at what percentage of them have had sexual abuse in the past mm. it's off the charts so and then just to finish what you were saying here is Clearly, we're talking about, since we're biopsychological social creatures, we are physical creatures that we have all this interlinking. If you have all these different pathways, rather than try to say everybody with depression is the same, mm. if you can disentangle that, then maybe you can actually start trying to have uh, remedies that are more uh, particular to whatever is the pathway that person is on. And at the same time, I do think there is some um, university, universality to what keeps us well. Mm. Diet, exercise, not yeah. being, you know, having some socialization, some place in society, meaning, you know. Well said. So I think this goes back to this problem of the conceptualization we embraced. These are discrete disorders. It blinds us to the complexity of what we're talking about. Here. Precisely. Which is... Of course, as a psychologist, exactly what I believe. And, and I, like, I like what you just said that, so there, I've, I've noticed a trend, several papers written recently highlighting the heterogeneity within people who have the same diagnosis. And that's very, very important to realize that the criteria have become so broad that the diversity within people who have the same diagnosis is actually very significant, which means of course that there's no way that the same treatment is going to be effective for all no. of them. And no. so there's this need to individualize treatment and at the same time to acknowledge the universal essentials to anyone's mental health. And so that, that's actually something I wanted to bring up and I'm aware of the time, so I'll maybe bring it up now <laughs> that one of the things that I think is hugely problematic about all of this is that, you know, may maybe there is a place for drug treatment. I think I can be convinced, but it's definitely not the first resort. That's not where the, its place is. In my opinion, it's, it should be much closer to the last resort and that yeah. there are many things we can do prior to prescribing drugs. So my question to you is, what do you think are some of those basic things that someone can do if they feel depressed or anxious or unstable in some way? What do you think are some of the basic and universal pillars of mental health? Yeah, by the way, I do think there's a place for drugs, <laughs> but the quits, not the way they're being used now, that's for sure. Listen, I, I think the answer to your question is this. What do we all need? to be well. So, uh, uh, first of all, sleep is very important. So can we think about how are you sleeping? And if you're not sleeping well, why not? Now, maybe it's because you're working two jobs and all. Uh, food is important. You mentioned my kids. Uh, you know, my daughter teaches in a, in a school in Brooklyn that has a lot of poor kids. It's not like they're all getting like nice breakfasts. You know what I mean? So food's important. And by the way, there are schools, there have been projects where they start feeding the kids well, breakfast and lunch, and they teach them how to cook. Mm -hmm. And you know what happens in those schools? ADHD diminishes dramatically just by that. So I, I think the short answer to this is, if we're gonna talk about people who are suffering, struggling, whatever way, we, we can try to help them, you know, there can be strategies developed for trying to alleviate that, you know, that sort of difficulty. At the same time, we should be telling people like, you need to make, maybe you need to make changes in your life, right? Um, and part of that changes is food, exercise, uh, socialization. Like I know a program, what it does is uh, it takes people who've come out of a hospital, mental hospital, 
and they will provide psychotherapy, free psychotherapy, if the people, and here's how the people have to pay for it. They have to volunteer two hours per week. Now, what does volunteer work do? Well, all of a sudden, they're helping others. They're no longer the person always being helped. It also gives them a sense of pride. Oh, what do I do? I work with the elderly. I work with the homeless. Right? I work in, a, in an animal shelter. It gives them meaning. It gives them purpose. It gives them a reason for leaving the house. My point is at the same, and you know, so we can look about trauma. We can look about what's happened to people. We can look about their stressors in life, say sort of the, the, the difficulties they may be having with friends, family, and that sort of thing. Uh, maybe there's poverty issues, but at the same time, we should also focus on a universality. It's how do we stay well or how do we get well? And, that, and I honestly believe that it comes down to trying to help people sleep, trying to get people to eat better, trying to get people to exercise, it, try to help people find meaning in life, a way to socialize with others. And meaning can come from simple things, just some way adding to civic sort of the civic life we're in yes. and so i think our approach has to be not just to try to remedy what's wrong with the person and focus on what's wrong and with the person but also how do we rebuild our lives so we're more likely to be well i think that and this can be true in psychology too with cbt and all this you're still focusing on what's wrong with this person mm -hmm. And you really should be like, how do you rebuild your life? Mm. I mean, that should be a big part of it in my, in my, my, my Amen. perspective. And, 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 and by the way, I think you also should do uh, initial tests to see if they have a disease. Do they have hormonal right. problems? They right. should be given a workup, a physical workup. You're right. I agree. And yeah, music to my ears. I, I mean, this is something that I find myself advocating in my life is, is, basically cover the basics and then see what persists, what type of conditions persist beyond that. Because if anyone's sleep deprived, they will experience cognitive impairment. If anyone is malnourished, they'll be emotionally unstable. If anyone is isolated, they'll be depressed. If anyone has, is, feels like their life is meaningless, they'll be very susceptible to despair. And so you could almost easily interpret symptoms of these conditions as signals that one of those things, one of those needs is not being met. Absolutely. I think, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, if you're, if, if you're depressed for this reason, maybe you're given a signal to change your life. Right. I, I right. really, I really believe in that wholeheartedly is because mm. in some ways, if we're not feeling well, then we are being given a signal that we need to change our life. By the way, every program you look at that, that focuses on this, the volunteerism work, helping kids eat better. For a long time in the UK, you could prescribe exercise. And you know what they would prescribe? You go out on a group walk. Mm. Or you go out in, and you help people maintain like a park or something like mm -hmm. this. And when they, when they would do surveys, people would love this. Yes. But it, it didn't fit into sort of a medical response, you know? Right. It's like, what am I writing a prescription for exercise for? But we know these things work. Right, exactly. So let me ask you the question, and again, I'm, I'm watching the time because I want to be respectful yeah, of the fine. time, but I'm sure you've gotten this question countless times. The question of what if someone is listening to this conversation who is taking a psychiatric drug and is now concerned about that, what should they do? What might be a path to safely get off of it? Yeah, well, the first thing they should do is not make a decision on what they heard here today. <laughs> uh, that's the first thing. Uh, second thing I would say is there are a spectrum of responses to psychiatric drugs. And sort of just what you were saying, the people that come into these categories, they're all, there's the heterogeneity, like there's such a heterogeneous genus group <laughs> that you, they don't all respond the same. Uh, at the same time, if you're not doing well, and you feel you want to make a change and you want to uh, perhaps taper from your drug, then you need to know that like um, that can be difficult because your brain has adapted to the presence of the drug. And then I would just say what you need to do is try to don't, before you make any decision, try to research it. Mm 
tried it and you can research it through uh, user groups, peer groups, there's information on the web. And hopefully you can talk to a doctor or a therapist and someone about what you want to do. And then because you've been on the drug and because your brain has adapted to it, withdrawal can be a difficult and even, even something of a perilous process. And so if you're going to move down this path, you need to understand the risks. Now, the, there are potential rewards too, because if you can get through it, uh, you know, I know so many people who, eventually made it off and said they feel like they got their lives back, that they were able to now interact with the world in a more full-bodied way than they had before. So what I'm saying to people is it's an individual decision. You shouldn't make a decision based on what you hear from here, but if things aren't going well for you or you are worried about the long-term effects, then you can start investigating possibilities and try to figure out how to do it safely and with support. There you go. Yeah, good answer. Are you are you in touch with um, Dr. P- Peter Bregan? I know Peter. Yeah, I figured. I figured, and I think that he's either writing or wrote a book specifically about how to withdraw from psychiatric drugs. So yeah, I think he's actually written properly. I, mean, I think he and uh, David Cohen wrote something called "Your Drug May Be Your Problem," mm. and then I think. Peter's written something on this. And there's some other tracks out there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, by by uh, one, one actually is by Will Hall. Uh, Will Hall is a person with lived experience. And he collaborated with other people with lived experience and professionals and wrote a, a book called The Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off Psychiatric Drugs. And you can just uh, Google that and it'll, mm-hmm. co- it'll come up and you, you can download it for free. Excellent. What I do like about that is it did arise a, a lot from user experiences. Mm. And then, you know, the, the other thing is, though, different drugs have different challenges to come off them. Right. There's also a manual for coming off benzodiazepines, mm. for example, that was written by Heather Ashton. Um, but this goes to the point of if you're going to move down this path, if one of your listeners is, you need to think about it and you need to research it and you need to do it thoughtfully yes it's a, it's a very it's a very good answer and you know I'll, I'll just say too it's it's very interesting to me given that i work with so many people who are addicted to drugs when people are addicted to Ill, illicit drugs there's no question that they should get off of it and just get through the withdrawal period and it's just very interesting i notice in myself and, and i think in all of us who are in this conversation how how much more delicately we recommend getting off of legal drugs. And it's just, it's interesting. I think we are right to be delicate about that because we don't want to be, of course, accountable for someone going through a psychotic break by suddenly withdrawing. But it's just interesting because, you know, people who are addicted to very similar drugs, for example, if you take Adderall and methamphetamine, very, very similar chemical structure, almost identical, and when someone's on methamphetamine, everyone's like, yeah, just stop. Do whatever it takes. Get through the withdrawal period. It will be worth it. But when someone's on Adderall, we're much more delicate with it. And we're like, okay, be really careful. Look into it. Get off only if you feel like you need to. And it, we, I mean, I, I feel willing to be very frank about it and say, these drugs are not meant to be long term. That's not how they're designed. That's not how they're tested or approved. And so... <laughs> it is worth taking very seriously to to figure out the strategy for coming off of them. Yeah. Listen, uh, these drugs aren't tested for long-term use. That's the first of all. Mm -hmm. Conceptually, you can see why if you, if you're perturbing some normal functioning, which is what illicit drugs do as well, Mm -hmm. you can see why they'd be problematic over the long term. And if you look at the, the research evidence, boy, I'll tell you, there's a lot of reason to want to come off, mm. to get off cognitive function, social functioning, physical health, et cetera. Mm. And just to your point, in his 1996 paper, Stephen Hyman said, we're talking all psychotropic drugs, illegal and legal. They, they, this is a paradigm for understanding all these drugs. Mm. There's this compensatory adaptation. Mm. And so he was basically saying, 
you know, there's, there's an artificial line between yes. prescribed drugs and illegal drugs. And, you know, uh, for example, going back to the ADHD drugs, um, methylphenidate, Ritalin, it, 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 its mechanism of action is basically the same as cocaine. Mm. The big difference is it lasts longer in the brain. So it's long-acting cocaine, which because it doesn't clear the body as fast, maybe you don't get the craving, mm. but that's what it is. And, you know, I'm not, I don't think we would say it's great to put a seven-year-old on, lo on long-acting, um, you know, cocaine for the next 12 years. Right. Would, would anybody say that? If, if a seven-year-old had been taking cocaine for nine months, would we go, eh, be careful about coming off that drug? So, but the, the point here is this. We, should, we really need to think of these drugs as drugs that alter how your brain functions, mm, whether it's really. illicit or, or legally prescribed, yes. and then talk to them or talk about them in that um, perspective, from that perspective. Exactly. Well, we have reached an hour long conversation here and I, I told you that we would only go that long and this has just been very rich and like I said it's just such a joy to actually talk to you in person after reading all of your work I am so grateful for what you have contributed to this conversation I mean you, you have single-handedly advanced it significantly in my opinion and I, I'm very grateful for your work well uh, Nick that's very nice of you to say but I, I think you know we're all trying to advance this discussion together right. is basically what we're doing. And you're doing this podcast helps do that. So thanks for having me on. It's been a real pleasure. You're welcome. I hope we can stay in touch. We will. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Nick. You're welcome. Ciao. If you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe.